let's talk about weight cutting real quick. <laughs> so I've, I've seen weight cutting break some of the toughest fighters, wrestlers, grapplers ever, like burnout break, like where they make them want to quit the sport. Yep. Um, so, you know, this is what people don't often talk about, but mentally it's one of the hardest things, especially when you're doing it kind of wrong <laughs> because it becomes a mental war. Um, so you competed, like you said, your whole career at 81 kilograms. You walked around at 88, 89. So about 15 pounds, sometimes 20 pounds over that. Give or, give or take. Yeah. And so what, uh, what was your process like mentally and physically? First of all, maybe you can comment on when the weigh-ins are relative to the matches. And then and what was your process like leading like a week ahead, a day ahead, an hour ahead, minutes ahead of the, of the weigh-in? Man, everyone varies tremendously because we're not like most sports because you're dropped off in foreign countries with who knows what, right? Some places have sauna, some places have treadmills. I went to a place one time in China in the middle of winter where the roads were frozen with ice and we had to use our hotel rooms because it was you couldn't sweat outside because it was too cold. All right. Um, and every one of my Olympics, the weight cut was different just given my mass. When I went to 2008, I was probably like 82, 83 kilos walking around. So weight cutting wasn't a thing for me in London, we actually weighed in the morning of. So weigh-ins were at like 6 a.m. And the Olympics were always beneficial to me because they actually don't start until like 10 or 11. So you actually were able to recover. Where on the circuit, you would weigh in at 6 a.m. and the competition started at 8 a.m. And it's like, well, I was cutting weight at 5 a.m. And most of it, for people who are not familiar, but maybe you can also correct me, most of it, you're really just, getting the water out of your system is, was water at that cut. point yeah at that like 24 hours before even like so are you like an hour before but yeah but like leading up to it um and do you, have you eaten the day before do you try to minimize the amount of food in your system my weight cutting process was a little bit different than than most people because i like to eat um i'm not I'm not the type of person that believes your athletic career is determined by your nutrition. Right. I don't I don't believe that. I think some sports are built that way, but when it comes to combat sports, like you know, your ability to knock somebody out has nothing to do with whether you had a cheeseburger or a salad. My ability to throw you is not determined by that. I may be able to perform better because I've eaten a certain way but not enough to justify an entire diet change. Your body is built and my body is built to operate with certain things that I've had in my system for years. Yeah, I think uh, I'm with you, but I also believe that there's a, mo a mental aspect. So if you're surrounded by people that tell you diet matters, yes. then if your diet is off, you're gonna believe you're going to be off because yep. the people around you tell you your diet should be good. So yeah, I, I think it's like, it's the same, I, I've had an argument with Matthew Walker, who's uh, who's a sleep scientist about sleep. And it's like, if you believe sleep is essential, it's essential to get eight hours of sleep every single night perfectly, then you're going to be very stressed when you don't get it. And then I think it will negatively affect, the stress will negatively affect your longevity and all kinds of aspects of your life. If you actually just learn to truly listen to your body, become a scientist for your own body with sleep and food, it might end up that it will be the eight hours a night or whatever, but it might be something else and Correct. probably diet your... I remember when I was meeting with the USOC nutritionist after London, it was probably around 2014, I think. And when we had our team meeting at the beginning of the year and I was talking to him, he was talking about the nutrition plans that he could put us on. And I was like, time out. I've done the USOC thing. Like I've done the couscous, I've done the lemon in my water. I go, I'm full shit. The couscous? Go, the yeah. couscous? Oh boy. Like there right. was just, cause there's like a cookie cutter plan, right? Yeah, right, right. And I was like, look, here's what I want you to do. I go, I'll listen to you, but you're gonna walk into the 7-Eleven across the street from the USOC. And if you can't buy it in that 7-Eleven, it's not on my plan. Right. I go, because I go to places where the only thing I can eat is Pringles. 
and a Snickers bar. Mm -hmm. I've done that. Like I've flown to Azerbaijan, stayed in a hotel where the restaurant is closed. USA Judo hasn't paid for the meal plan. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's available is the thing across the street. So you were eating Pringles. Before fighting a Grand Slam event and while cutting 20 pounds. And a, and a, and a Snickers bar. Yeah. I just, I go, the visual of that, that's some like, that's some Rocky shit. Okay. Build, build me a nutrition plan, go for it. Cause I'm not paying my own way to travel with 14 days of food. Right. I mean, that's that's one of the magic of your whole career and also judo. I mean, I'm sorry to say, of course you want athletes to be super rich and super well-funded from an athlete perspective and the sport to be popular and managed in an ultra competent way. But as that's a fan- That's not reality. But as a fan, it's fun to watch somebody like you who's exceptionally driven have to suffer in all these different <laughs> interesting ways. In but order it's, to, in, it's only suffering if you expect the other side. Right. I don't expect it. I accept it for what it is, yeah. which is why I write off nutrition for athletes. Right. Cause it can be done without it as long as, you know, to what you said before, like, you don't believe you need it. Yeah. Some people believe they need it. So the mind, getting your mind right is the most important thing. You, you know what I believe I need? What's that? A Snickers bar when I'm tired. Mm. I want a little bit of sugar. Makes me feel better. <laughs> what do you want me to do? So you... <laughs> Uh, That's what are you gonna do? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I just love the, the the visual of you eating a Snickers but that's bar what, before that's became, But that became part of my nutrition plan. When the USOC guy wrote my nutrition plan, I was eating a burrito bowl mm -hmm. with brown rice, white meat chicken, black beans, guacamole, cheese, two chocolate chip cookies, mm -hmm. and a Diet Coke. This is like Chipotle? Uh, it or? was Boloco, but same concept. Same same concept with two, because two, it two chocolate chip cookies because I needed the sugar. I was I was 88 kilos when I stepped on the scale at 6.3% body fat. Now I got to make 81. You're Six, not, what? Really? Yeah. And the USOC was like, hey, you know, you can't, you can't fight 81 anymore. You have to fight 90s. And I go, I'm already into the quad. I'm not changing. I go, build me a plan where I can do this. And now we have to have an acceptable weight cut. Like it just, what do you want me to do? I'm not the IJF. I can't just change the fact that it takes two years to qualify. Hmm. I know where I'm at. I know what I have to go through and I accept the consequences. It is what it is. We want. <laughs> All right. So what was the process? I mean, can you, can you speak to, so you, you wake up early in the morning, the, the day of the weigh-ins a few hours before? Technically my weight cut never started until I got off a plane and to a hotel. And how many hours? Three days. So it's a three day cut. It's a three day cut. M mentally you're thinking of it that way. Yep. And then you're still eating. I eat every day. And then like, what do you load up on water maybe as you start and then- Nope. Or did the, the water st stops? Yeah, just, it is what it is. <laughs> so you, I mean, it's a slow, you're not actually like, sweating all three days, yeah. are you? But then it's like torture to sleep. Part of the process. Are you able to sleep? Sometimes, it depends. So you're dehydrated, further and further dehydrated with six, 7% body fat, trying to lose 10 pounds. I even developed a way to drink water out of a bottle where I don't drink anything, but I feel like I have. Uh, swishing it, what's the- No, so like I take like a bottle of water and like if we were to like to draw a line on it, I would tip it and I would go like this, I'd go. And you would draw that line, but like I've drank now water for 20 seconds or whatever it is. And I feel, and I, and your I get the fix. Like, yeah. Brain told uh, me I got there, no problem. That's amazing, man. You just, your mind's a very powerful tool. And the the problem a lot of people have is they don't accept the reality of the situation. They bitch about the reality of the situation. I just. First of all, you could always quit, right? Yep. So like, you're not. Ex that's never not missed weight. Never. Never missed weight. <laughs> you, can, you can perform poorly. You can't miss weight. Don't miss weight. Don't miss weight because you 
you can always win regardless of how bad the weight cut is. You can never win if you miss weight. But your your brain is also really good. Maybe not your brain, <laughs> but I know my brain, I think most people's brains are good at generating, the more desperate things become, the better it's, it's at generating excuses. So what were you doing with your mind that resulted in you never missing weight? The plan. So like I said, like my weight cut would never start until I got to the hotel because I didn't check my weight the morning of, I didn't check my weight when I got there. I just, while I'm traveling, I'm doing things at like a minimal level, but I'm never not giving myself something I'm craving. If I'm thirsty, I'm drinking a Diet Coke. If I'm hungry, I'm buying a Snickers bar. I'm buying a sandwich. I am. And I accept the consequences when I get there. And then when I get there, if I step on the scale and it says 88 kilos, I instantaneously know exactly what it's going to take to be 81. And then you just follow like a robot, follow a very specific process. Yep. And then, I mean, because there's a lot of seconds in three days, seconds and minutes, and you just... I just know exactly what it takes from my body. I know exactly what a one-hour gym workout wearing a sauna suit is going to take. I know exactly what I'm going to lose on day one, and I know exactly what I'm going to lose on day three because they're not the same. So I can instantly look at a hotel, decide, is there a bathroom, sauna, gym, temperature of the gym, access to the gym and when it is, access to the judo mats, my training partners, the roads versus street lights, the weather outside. I can take a look at that environment and say, this is my weight, this is weigh-ins, and instantaneously in my head, there's a plan to make weight. And you have a sense of how much sweat adds up to, to 10 pounds, how much sweat plus time, yep. just and. I make sure in my plan, all of my meals and how much water I need in between is allocated to still make weight because you have to eat or drink during that time. Are you incorporating like mental exhaustion into this? That doesn't exist. So it doesn't? Uh, it doesn't. 